Welcome to the Hey Kings podcast brought to you by Vermeer, your expert in hand forge equipment. I want to say a special thank you to Vermeer for sponsoring this podcast. Without their help, none of this would be possible. Please visit vermeer.com forward slash Hey Kings for more information. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Jesse Bounds. Jesse is in the hay industry in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. He exports hay and probably some other stuff that we're about to hear about. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Tell us more about your location. Tell us how you got started. So we're located in Junction City, Oregon. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, which is just south of Junction City, about 10 or 15 miles. And I worked for a uh, grass seed farmer in high school. Uh, I started with him when I was 16. And then, similar to yourself, I bought a baler. I actually started with a wire baler. I think it was like a 47 International that my dad had. (laughs) And my dad hated hay. So they're in the uh, construction industry or field. He wanted nothing to do with it. He'd actually send me out to deck mow as 10 acres so that he didn't have to hay it. So in high school, I went to work for a farmer and we did, uh, we were running Massey three tie balers. Uh, this is before the big bales, and luckily the 1065 bale wagons were gone. So I started out running a 1085 bale wagon. Ah, I have a 1075. So oh yeah. So see, I've never even ran one that old. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, mine's so. an antique. It still block stacks though. That's the important they're, part. They're great machines. So yeah, bent some push off feet probably my first day stack and <laughs> learned all about that and uh but yeah i missed the freeman days luckily i heard all about it saw lots of parts stacked in mm. you know mm-hmm. uh, sheds so yeah th- they were three tying and they were exporting straw uh this farmer farm so oh, i think at the time was a couple thousand acres of grass seed so for a lot of people we actually primarily do grass seed so the lamette valley is known to be the grass seed capital of the world and that stretches from about portland uh, there is grass seed grown up in the lower Washington area there on the freeway, but you know it stretches all the way down to about just south of Eugene is where the grass seed pretty much stops um, down at Cresswell Cottage Grove. And so, um, yeah, I worked for this farmer. He had a feed store. He's, they're still they still do, and uh, worked for him in high school. Then he was doing custom hay, and he was doing it. He wouldn't do small fields. You know, he would do pretty like fifteen to twenty acres, but. There's all these people calling the feed store all the time that he owned, wanting to do five and 10 acre fields. And we had about 30 acres split up in three fields where my parents' um, property was in Eugene, and no one was doing anything with it. I tried to use that wire baler. It was completely, it hadn't been used in years. The plunger was rusted shut and <laughs> <laughs> killed the tractor a couple of times to get it going. And I did, I was able to, to get some wire bales made, but I bought, I think it was a 336 John Deere baler mm-hmm. and a four, yep, and a 4430 John Deere, which I still have that tractor. Um, oh, those are, and that's, that's kind of a classic tractor. Yeah. It is a classic. And I don't, that's, yeah. I uh, had a couple of people try to buy it from me. I'm like, no, nope, first tractor, I'm not getting rid of it. So <laughs> I don't get rid of much. So still have that. But basically what I started doing was all the fields nobody wanted to do. As you know, like you talked about, it's hard to get into this industry. Typically, all the big fields are tied up. Somebody else is doing it. Yep. And you don't have the equipment to go in there and, and maybe do the big jobs. Would, and you, that's, would you say that's how, like, if you're just starting fresh, you have to start with the small stuff that nobody yeah. else wants to do? Yeah, unless you're obviously some of these, some people, their family was in it or something. But if you if your family's not in it, Mm-hmm. Or your or your family is, and you're starting on your own because I, I I've seen both scenarios where somebody's family's in the hay industry or farming, and, and you know something's happened or they want to go their own direction, and they got to start on their own. Typically, that's the easiest. You know, you got to start out on your own, and you got to start small. That's unless you can partner with someone. I was pretty fortunate that I found some really good people to work with, and that's really where things took off. So what happened was I started doing these small fields that nobody wanted to do. Then, of course, the first problem comes where you're going to store the hay. <laughs> so, yep. No barns. I had nothing. I mean, there was no barns. There was no anything. So, And you get enough rain that tarping works, but not yes, really well and not, not for very I, long. 
No, it doesn't work as well as it does in other areas. We get a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. So in Oregon, we typically start getting weather, you know, oh, you want things put away by October. And so all winter long, we can get a lot of rain. And yeah, you got to do your tarp stacks right. We, we got to fully wrap and plastic and it's got to be well-drained rock. And it's, you can't just do roadside, field side stacks and get away with it. Yep. So I needed a barn. So actually the guy that I was working for, he had a, a barn that he stopped using. It was really small. It was probably 60 by 60, 20 foot eaves. I could be, I bail wagoned into that thing um, to start with. But I was interested in the straw because as I was working for him, um, so that first year, uh, let's see, I think I bought that bale or probably when I was like 16 or 17, I worked for him the first summer. So when I was 16, I worked for him all summer. And then I bought a baler and started doing hay when I was 17 and I got my hay done and I went back to work for him the summer when I was 17. And then I worked that winter and I bought a truck. I don't know if I was 17 or 18 for sure when I bought that truck, but I know I wasn't old enough to go get it. And that was, <laughs> I, I had to go get it and it was in California, but you know, there was two problems that came. One was I needed a barn to store in, and the other was I needed a truck to deliver. And that's where I have this 359 Peterbilt that we post a lot on social media, and everybody, it's got the truck bed on it. And that was my original truck. Uh, and I, we, I saw that. I want, yep. I want that setup. <laughs> that, is the, that is the best hay hauling setup there is. And so I bought that, um, saw it in the Capitol Pro course back then. It was just the Capitol Press. Mm-hmm. And I get a lot of people messaging me now because I haven't hammered social media too hard and I've been working it pretty good the last six months. And a lot of younger people are asking me, well, where do you advertise that? Well, back when I started, we had to do paper and it was money saver, nickel ads. I hit every paper that I could find on the coast, Southern Oregon, and I just paid for ads of for hay. And we used that truck to deliver all that hay and we did it 10 ton at a time. And we actually would set up a lot of the deliveries where people would only want two or three tons. And so we'd put together an order for 10 ton. And then I would make three or four stops. I'd make a day out of it. And I drove truck pretty much from, say, 2000 all the way to for about 12 years. So I put my press in in 2012 and I was still driving truck then. I ran that small baler and then I, and then I was able to partner with a guy that was exporting. And so he was doing, he had a Stefan press and back then they were pressing two tie. I thought, well, that's interesting because I wanted to have a better two tie baler because I needed to make squeeze blocks. That little John Deere doesn't make, didn't make very good squeeze blocks. We tried. Oh, right. Uh, yep. No, Four, 14 by 18s don't make good yeah, squeeze blocks. They don't know. So we jumped up. So he had a inline two tie, you know, Massey or Agco. So he let me use that. And I bailed all of my grass hay and I did, and I started doing a lot of wheat straw. And back then, no one was really doing wheat straw. So I, I was really going after the things that nobody wanted. So little fields that nobody wanted to do, and then wheat straw. Um, a mutual friend of mine that was farming, he had a contact at Portland Meadows at the horse race track. And so we started taking up, oh, five or 10 time. I actually think the first delivery we made, I didn't have my truck when we first did that first delivery. We just took a pickup trailer, a pickup and a trailer to Portland Meadows. And we took Timothy Hay that he, he had about a 15 acre Timothy Hay field. And we took that and then we took uh, some wheat straw. I went to a couple of feed stores and a for, uh, wanting to sell wheat straw because there was no market really for wheat straw back then, very much of one. And of course, the feed store said, We're already buying it from someone. So I left my card and left. They called later. That winter, they called and said, Hey, our guy that we get wheat straw from is out. So, you know, you got to be persistent and go back. I luckily didn't have to go back. Um, but I should looking back if I, uh, I door knocked a lot and I, I haven't been very good at that the last few years. Cause you get really busy just going to see people and door knocking and being persistent. And with social media, you guys can do that a lot faster now. I mean, just post, if you just post, you can get so much attention so fast. So, so they, so we are doing two tie squeeze blocks he had a 1095 bail wagon. I bought a 1085 bail wagon soon after that. So I had an inline baler and an 85 bail wagon. I wanted to go to um, three tie. I was getting tired of picking up blocks, falling apart. Met um, Eric and Sharon Shrink. They were running 585 New Hall on three ties. 
ah, and they were yep. exporting. They had they had their own press. Now That's those are the uh, those are the inline. Yep, inline. Yeah, I kind of wanted to do more, and the guy I was working with, I, I had really more product than it seemed like he could use, and so Eric and Sharon approached me and said, "Hey, why don't you come bail with us?" And you, know, you can buy a new baler. We'll buy all your straw, and then you can custom bale for us. I thought, wow, this is great. And they were right in uh, Junction City. So really good fit. So I ended up working with them until they sold the operation. And uh, I only got to work with them a couple of years. But they they ran, they had 10 uh, 585 and BB900 three tie-in line balers. And then they had about five or six stack wagons, mostly all 1095s. All New Holland, pretty much equipment. They ran... 216 New Holland rakes and 1431 Dispine mowers and really nice operation. Worked with them. They let, uh, but then my next problem was I didn't have a, a, a hay squeeze. And so I was always borrowing, you know, a hay squeeze. Called down to Sunny D. A lot of people uh, don't know. They always ask, what, what are these, what are these things you're posting, these trucks? <laughs> so those are the, they're, they're Sunny D road runners and they're made in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Ed's two years out right now. He's <laughs> back ordered. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now what you're they, what you're talking about this road runner, I, I think yeah. I can describe it. If you take the cab of a semi truck and the nose and the engine, and then in place of like where the fifth wheel plate is, you put a forklift yep. right on the back. Yep. You, it's a, a forklift mast, and then the biggest bear hug squeeze you've ever seen in your entire life to pick up six three by four big bales or a, or a squeeze block. But the whole idea here is that you can run down the road, Roadrunner, right? Uh, yep. We're talking about a, a brand name here. Uh, but you can drive that truck down the road at 50, 60 miles an hour to get to the next stack to load the next truck. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so down in uh, Oregon, we, we roadside stack everything out in the field. So we, or we field stack it in the field. We don't, take, we don't take it off the fields like you do with pivots and in a lot of other areas, California and Washington, you know, Idaho, all, pretty much everywhere else, they'll, you know, take everything to the side of the pivot so they can yep. get the water started. But yep. we don't, most of these fields aren't irrigated. So we stack everything. We take the road runners out to the fields to load all the trucks in the fields. And then a lot of times we have another road runner at an offsite storage location unloading trucks. So one's loading, one's unloading. Yep, one's unloading. We run a cycle of you know three to eight trucks on a haul, depending on you know how far we're going. So yeah, so I needed a road runner. I was borrowing Eric and Sharon squeeze. They would use it all day, and we would, me and my friends would go get that thing in the middle of the night. We'd run it all night long. And I remember one morning she calls and says, where in the heck is that squeeze at? And I said, well, we're still out here alone. And she says, you got to get back here. We got to go to work. <laughs> and uh, so it would have been a lot harder to get going if it wouldn't have been for a couple people there that really helped me get to where I was at. And unfortunately, they sold the company and retired. And so then I was kind of on my own again. It really took me a long time to find someone to buy my product. I was really struggling to find a press company that would could buy it every year. You know, mm -hmm. they'd call you up and say, presses are really good about not being consistent. So they're either on <laughs> or off. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's and it's not any particular business model. It's the nature of the export market, it's right? It's just, yeah, the export markets, yes, it's on or it's off. And so that doesn't work well for straw or hay. I was driving trucks. We're kind of we're going to jump pretty fast here. So that we're going to go now in 2011, 12, I was driving truck up to Washington into uh, Toppenish and I was hauling alfalfa from Christmas Valley up, up to Washington press hay. And I really wanted to press, but they're millions of dollars. I mm -hmm. had had quotes from Steffens and Hunterwood and everybody. And I really didn't want to get into it, to be honest with you. I really just wanted to find someone to buy my straw. I, I was really focused in farming and trucking, but I knew that, it was something I was going to have to do. And I was uh, unloading hay. We were rolling tarps at this press I was at. They were taking, it's a GFI is the company in Toppenish, uh, Luke and Ward Deaton. And they were taking the this old press apart and they were putting it in apple totes. And I said, what are you guys doing with that thing? I said, oh, we're throwing it away. And I said, well, can I buy that from you? And they were like, well, yeah. And I said, well, I don't have any money though. <laughs> <So> <laughs> <laughs> that's the one problem. So... You know, I don't know. It was maybe a couple weeks or a month. And Ward says, calls me up and says, you know, we got a deal worked out. And so he let me truck that thing off. So basically, he paid me um, for my fuel and my driver's wage. 
and that we traded the profit side of the trucking towards the press. And he let me come get that thing and we put it in and it was a challenge. It had been, oh, that thing, that press has kind of been around from California up to his place back to mine and it was pretty cobbled together. Hmm. So we really struggled with that thing to get it going and it was set up to do three tie and I was still three tying with those. I actually had a yeah. couple inline Masseys in New Holland's, but we had yep. started big bailing, right? Mm-hmm. So I had, we had to build a slicer for that thing. And that was quite a project <laughs> to cut big bales down right. I mean, we've that that's a real to get big bales cut down right to go into a press. They have to be right, or it doesn't work. What you're talking about here, you know, if you're fixing your kid's lunch in the morning, and you take that apple and you set it on the counter, and then you have that thing that you push over top of the apple and it falls into slices, right? You you're creating that but you're doing it with a hay bale right except it's not yep. it's not falling into wedges you're cutting a big bale into three slabs yeah so on our press we were quartering it the slicer that we had that luke had was a, an old stuff and slicer that was was uh like you're talking a lot of the stuff and slicers are on edge and they cut in three slabs he had turned this slicer the other way and had it set up to quarter cut but the knives weren't centered in that thing. And so when we were, well, we didn't realize when we were cutting slabs at first, <laughs> our quarters weren't all the same. So our pieces going in the press, they were inconsistent. We're, we were trying to duplicate the size of a three tie. So we just fought that thing. And finally, we got some new night. We spent quite a bit of time on that slicer. And once we got that tuned in, but these new machines now, it's just a whole nother world. It's, it's, I, I love <laughs> that so much of that early pressing industry was trying to get a big bale, trying to get the efficiencies <laughs> of a big bale to look like the package of a three a three tie. Yes. Three tie ran. Oh my gosh. When we'd run three tie, it just ran. I mean, even the straw, straw presses really hard. It's springy, right? It's springy. When you're trying to press it, you know, you've got to kill that stuff for say 20 seconds. When you're trying to kill straw, it's just pushing right back at you. Alfalfa or grass hay. We talked about this with one of the guys uh, from Agco, uh, formerly with Agco, talking about deadening the cell membrane. That's what you're Mm -hmm. talking about, is really getting it so it doesn't spring back. Yeah. I've had people not agree with me because of uh, science. They they say, well, it doesn't matter your speed. My old press doesn't run as fast. And so the extend speed on the cylinder's slower. And we struggle... Uh, getting container weight with that machine. And I said, well, we need to hit it harder. And they're like, well, it's still pressing the same. And I said, well, if you drive a car into a wall at 60 or 30, the car that hit the wall at 60 is going to dent that wall a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something to be said with that. I mean, because if you try to, and it would be like a plunger in a baler, you know, it's the same idea. We're just trying to basically push that. We're pushing all that material against an end wall. And we've got to hold that for a certain amount of time because if you don't hold that and you let the cylinder come all the way off, then it just bounces back and the bale quality is really poor and you don't get any weight in it. So yeah, there's been a lot of time spent trying to make big bales look like three ties and then get a good bale coming out of a hay press. And that's where baling, honestly, baling is probably the, one of the most important parts when you get um, long bales, uh, inconsistent bales, it really comes down to the balers, which everybody knows comes. It all follows back into the field with the rakes and the combines. And yeah, whether it's a swather or yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. it all has to when, be done right. When I worked for that farmer in high school, we had old eleven, uh, sixteen, eleven, eighteen, and thirty-eight, thirty. Oh, uh, swathers. New Holland yeah. and John yeah, Deere. Yeah, and Deere's. And it was a disaster. There was piles. It was just because the equipment was old and wore out. And there was piles everywhere in the field from from the swathers clogging up. And when the combines would come through, then the combines were broke consistently. Oh, because they hit a big wad. Yep. Hit a big wad, plug up, have to stop, drop a pile. Well, then you show up to bail and you've <laughs> got piles everywhere. Well, that you sounds know how terrible. That works. It was a mess. And yeah. So, it all started with the swathing, right? If the swathing was good and the combining was smooth, the raking, the bailing, the set, I mean, just everything flows. And so, you know, I learned that from Eric. Eric was a perfectionist mm. and he just, everything he did was perfect. You know, they never got in a big hurry. They were just really consistent and they did a really good job at everything they did. And it just, the whole operation ran so smooth. And I think, 
that was some, I was, I'm so blessed that I was able to learn from him, you know, of how to take care of your equipment. Just don't get in a big hurry and all that stuff. It'll last you forever and your day will just go so much smoother. So I think that's, that's something we all get in a hurry when we're doing hay. <clears throat> and it's the same thing with moisture. I used to put up a lot of grass. I used to do about 1,500 acres of grass in the Lamont Valley, which is really tough to do because we get a lot of rain, a lot of ground moisture. A lot of dew. Yep. Oh my gosh, the dew. And so what I learned a lot, I put up a lot of grass hay. You know, when we get hay rained on, people say, what do you do? We well, you got to ted it. You know, we ted a lot down here and just you don't get in a hurry. I bailed some orchard grass one time before a thunderstorm. It was the worst thing I did trying to get in a hurry. It, it didn't have a, we never had a fire or anything, but it, you know, we had to separate the blocks and all that. And I said, you know, if I would have just stuck to my guns and just waited another day, it would have got rained on, but I wouldn't, have, I was, I ruined the hay either way. You yeah, know what I mean? Right, right. It, but um, one way you had mold and the other hay, you just had lower quality dry hay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Lower quality dry hay always will sell a lot easier than wet moldy hay. Uh, yes, um, every day of the week. Yeah. Let's take a break there and we'll get a word from our sponsor. From the hay field to the feed bunk, look to Vermeer. You've got livestock to feed. You know about our lineup of mowers, rakes, and balers. Now we're taking our legacy to the bunk. Introducing the Vermeer lineup of vertical mixers and feed wagons. 20 different makes and models to fit your operation. Durable, long-lasting components and accurate scales with Bluetooth capability. From the field to the feed bunk, look to Vermeer. So yeah, we started exporting in 2012. We had a fire in 16, so the whole facility basically burned. We were supposed to be putting a brand new Hunterwood press oh, in. That was and, you. I heard about that. Yeah. It was the same time, and uh, there was a couple fires up in Washington. I think it was the same inland tarp had a fire, and then I think it caught <laughs> yes. some of Anderson stacks on fire. So all of that uh, was kind of Whit- the same Whit- time. Whitby stacks, but yeah. Whitby's. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and my fire, I think, was either the same year or, or within a year. So, yeah, we were getting ready to put a new Hunterwood press in, and then that happened, and that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother story for another day about insurance. Oh, um, I bet. One of my friends, unfortunately, just went through one on Friday. Uh, um, so I was talking to him this weekend. So, yeah, something that that is something that everybody really needs to be aware of with your insurance and your policies. And like I say, that's a that's something that what? I know I'll be going over on my podcast a lot because it's something that really, really has to be. What's uh What's the one question that you would advise people to ask their insurance agents? The biggest thing you want to make sure is make sure that you guys have blanket policies on your equipment for your, they call it mobile ag, but make sure you don't have where all of your implements and tractors have to be listed. That's an easy box for them to check. And so what happens is if you have a total loss or let's say you, and a total loss means everything gets burned up. So if you've got a bunch of equipment in a barn and you have a fire, they'll come in and say that you might think that all that equipment and your agent, the problem is your agent might've thought that it was all, covered but if somebody else was filing the paperwork and they missed mixed missed checking a box it doesn't matter you get paid on whatever that whatever boxes and whatever however that policy was wrote yeah and the policy that you have isn't going to be the policy the insurance company has and, and what i mean is when they when after my fire they showed up the insurance company they said well we'll get you your policy and i said well i have the little you know the nice little book that my agent gave me and they said no your policy is 330 pages you've never seen it oh and i went what? <laughs> <laughs> so making sure that you have a blanket policy for all your equipment, because, you know, we all have, you know, rakes and tatters and harrows and bail wagons, all these things and tools, right? Yep. And if it's a, if it's supposed to be a line item, entitled equipment, make sure that all, I had a lot of equipment that was paid for that was titled. That doesn't fall under your mobile ag policy. So if you've got equipment trailers or anything like that, semi trucks and trailers and just, you know, things around there that have a title, that doesn't fall under your mobile ag policy and that has to be listed. I would say that's the, the one thing that can get missed the easiest and probably the most important. That's a good bit of information. All right. So you've had the fire. Your insurance has come and gone left you feeling sad what happens next (laughs) we were down for about a year i was having other people uh, press for me actually my friend that just had his fire um friday he pressed for me most people didn't want to press for me my competition didn't want to help me we got through that 
got the press back up and running, our original machine, because it had had some water damage. All the computers and stuff had gotten screwed up. So we had to rebuild that. So we got running mm. about a year later. I wanted to get my new press. It took me a couple years to clean up my financials because that loan was, you know, any lenders want to see, you know, they want to see performance, right? And so I just yep. came out of a pretty, pretty crappy two years. What I had to do is I had to perform now. Um, I, I had sent um, Hunter Wood a deposit for the new press, but the bank pulled out of the loan and I had to fire. So Hunter Wood had my deposit that was I had just sent cash. I had jumped the gun and sent the money prior to having a loan. I was like, I know I'm going to get this loan done. And so I sent the deposit to lock my spot and then I had a fire and they had my money and I didn't have a loan. Mm-hmm. And they, they sold, Hunter Wood sold out during that time too. So then I was concerned that I would lose my deposit, that the new company might not honor that, which they did. Hunter Wood honored my deposit, even though it was new owners. I had to perform for basically two years with my bank and show, you know, good numbers and profitability and a track record. And then I had to build out a, how I was going to afford this machine. And a lot of that was based on efficiencies. So I'd say the hardest thing was getting the loan for that press was, was really the most difficult part of the whole, the whole purchase. So we got that done, got the press installed just in time for COVID. We got it run in the fall of 19 and then COVID hit. Had some pretty good months of shipping. You know, um, the early part of 20 was really good because the ports, um, there was a lot of containers here, a lot of availability. Ports were wide open, right as kind of COVID was was yeah. starting. We got a lot of product shipped on time and we really got some really good production. And then, as you know, which you've talked about on your podcast several times, the difficulties of shipping. Oh, yeah. And now we're in a whole different world. So that's pretty much the 20-year overview. That. Begs the question. You're on social media. We see you working on trailer projects. We see lots of stuff going on. What's next for you? So we've got this, our old press. uh, We got it back up and running. We're actually adding some automation. So that'll be a project that we're going to be rolling out. We're hopefully going to start a YouTube channel. Um, after the first of the year in a podcast. So really probably start working on more marketing and just letting people be aware of what we do a lot. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of bad publicity about exporting. I get messages all the time and comments about, you know, we're exporting all the water. And My, uh, my response to that is always, as soon as we stop exporting corn and soybeans, I'll stop exporting <laughs> hay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at about 20 loads of wheat straw that's supposed to be going to a dairy, and all the dairies are full of products. So there's plenty of forage for them on the West Coast. Yeah. And if anybody needs any wheat straw, I've got 20 loads right here. So I just uh, uh, I just ran the numbers. I shifted our production or our exports to match our production a little bit. In 2021, 23% of grass hay on the west coast and 15 percent of the alfalfa went for export and that's just the west coast that's yeah. that's washington idaho oregon montana utah nevada Col- uh i don't think i included colorado arizona new mexico like the, the 13 <laughs> western states right uh or 11 yeah. 11 western states only a quarter of the grass hay produced goes for export and 15 percent of the alfalfa it's not yes. that big of a deal. <laughs> like, yeah. In, in terms of the industry, it absolutely is. But in terms of total production, it's still relatively small and nothing compared to corn, soybeans, and wheat. Yeah, no. And, and so we primarily export this grass seed straw. Yep. And there's not a secondary market. We sell yeah, there's, you know, wheat straw domestic. I sell all my kickouts domestic. I've got, we actually put a chaff press in, so we, which we take all of our loose sweepings off the floor and we repress that into a hunter with chaff press. And I sell that domestically and export. And I actually have to export that chaff, which I don't want to. I'd rather sell it domestic. We export it because we we can't find a home for all of it. That's that's literally why we put that in. We were when we had our fire, it was the chaff that started on fire. We uh, we were hauling that to a dairy for free. So I had two fifty three foot dry vans that we were shoving chaff in. We were hauling it, delivering it, giving it to the dairy. And they said, we can't take it anymore. We don't need it. And we shoved it outside, made a big pile. And then it that's what caught on fire. And so after that, we put the chaff press in so that we could take the chaff every day. The chaff press just runs and we take it over there and we repress it. And we load about five containers a week of chaff and we export it because we just don't have enough of a local market for that material. And so you take, you know, there's what, three to 400,000 acres of grass seed straw in the Willamette Valley. So, I mean, you're talking... 
from any given year, seven to 800,000, if you're a two ton average, I mean, there's a lot of straw that there's, there's not a dairy or feedlots that need that material here. Right. And, uh, and that's why well, we export. And really that industry started because they were just burning the piles of yes. grass straw. Yep. A lot Lit- of data, a lot of history on that. Uh, yeah. And Lots yeah, of rules they, and regulations now. Yes. yes. There's a little bit of straw that can be burned. Um, Central Oregon, you can burn bluegrass fields. They don't burn the straw typically. They burn just the fields. But I think they're using mostly the mint burners on those a lot of the times. Yeah, and that's a that's an agronomic thing where the bluegrass straw produces better when the fields are burned. Yep, and fine fescue. We've but we've been trying. We've actually created a fairly decent market for fine fescue. There was still a fair amount of fine fescue that was burned up there in the up by Stephens. You know, mm-hmm. your friends are up in the Silverton Hills, and we've actually been exporting a, a fair amount of that because they haven't been able to burn very much the last couple of years. Right. And so we've created a market for that overseas, and there's not a domestic market for that material. So um, the export market works. Works really good for everybody, the growers, you know, the, I mean, it's just, it creates, you know, a tremendous amount of opportunity for everybody. So, yeah. and it provides seed for the rest of the country, right? It makes that seed production less expensive for everybody when the straw byproduct, or maybe in this case, you should think about it as a co product, has value. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, and, and it's just education. So a lot of people don't know that. And that's something that I, you know, there's a lot of bad publicity out there because of what's went on in California and Arizona with water. Mm-hmm. And so we get tied into that. So I just want to, you know, with the podcast, I think that'll help. And with the YouTube channel, we can show more of what we're doing. So yeah, we have these curtain van trailers that we're, I'm sitting here looking at them. We've got, we're going to, we're putting those together. We've got a couple road runners, uh, those hay squeezes we're going to go through this winter in the shops. So I think it'd be cool to show some of these shop projects you know, on YouTube. Yeah. I just think that, you know, I really, the last couple of years, especially after my fire, I was so focused in my lane and what I was doing. I didn't even realize that I, I didn't ever get on YouTube much and social media. And I, all of a sudden I look at these channels and I'm like, holy smokes, there's like 500,000 million views on these farming YouTube channels. Yeah. It blew me away. Yeah. Um, and even your, even, even Hey Kings, I been a member of the group, you know, I'd seen the group, I'd been a member. And then I actually got out of all my groups and yep. then I didn't realize, you know, what I created a small group the other day. I'd never realized how much um, interaction there was on them. So I think it's really cool. Mm-hmm. People want peers. People want folks to share their experience with. It's part of the human condition, right? To share their experience with others. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I, I forgot to mention that we're going to do is, I'm hiring, um, hopefully, a videographer and an editor full time. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually do a lot of educational videos, and we're going to post those on YouTube. Mm-hmm. So we're actually going to build out an online training program for our company. So our, and then a lot of that content we're going to put out onto YouTube. So something as simple as we ha- um, how to chain up a truck, you know, how to tie down a load, how to load a truck. So a lot of these things, how to moisture check, a lot of those things yeah. when we hire employees and we onboard them. Um, at our scale house or a summer harvest driver, we, you know, we have to physically go out and, and we still will obviously train these people, but it lets them, um, you know, if they've got a question, they don't, they don't remember. Funny enough, I started doing the exact same thing. Obviously I started with the things that I was having to teach people over and over and over as the boss, as the manager, as the guy in charge, you're like, why am I spending my time teaching this 10 times to every employee? Right. And that doesn't change a lot year to year. Things like, how do you use the fuel card? How do you blow off the swath? How do you service the swather, right? What are the things that you do every day? Well, you put fuel in it, you take the air filter out, you blow the air filter out. Once everything, then you clean off the machine and then you check the oil and you check the all the fluids. Like, here's where you check this, here's where you check this, right? All of those things that you do all the time. Every single day, all throughout the season, you get one new person, you have to hit the brakes and train them how to do those things. I just started creating videos on my phone. And then when somebody needed to know something, I just went to my video library and I'm like, oh, there's the Swather service video. Send. And you can do it, I guess, on a private YouTube channel. That's that's where I was going next was okay. I have I have a private YouTube channel set okay. up so I can share with my employees my unique uh I have preferences on how my equipment gets treated, right? And I have preferences on how things get done. And sometimes that's the weather conditions here that dictate one way or the other. You can do that and it's a great tool. 
I'm really excited to hear you saying that you're doing some of this. Yeah, we're going to hopefully put ours on light. So our online training for our employees <clears throat> will be hosted on Lightspeed. And so the cool thing about that is we'll be able to, let's say we want to move them from one position to the next, or they want to move up in the company. Yep. They can go through and watch a series of videos and then actually have an online test too. Uh, to make sure I like that, that test idea, yeah. Yeah, and then like safety meetings and things where it's hard to, you know, if I've got a video I want to do for, you know, everybody in the company and, you know, you've got people, you know, working remotely or whatever, you can go on there and, and post that video and it'll go to everybody and you'll you'll get analytics of making sure that it's, you know, being watched all the way through. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot that we'll be able to do. And so, we're, but we're going to start, we're going to start by finding uh, a videographer and an editor. So I'm on the hunt now for that. And then we can start in 23 rolling, rolling that out. And we got to do the same for our coffee shop that we're opening. So <laughs> we've got a lot of projects. Thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. So thank you. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. For more information about Hey Kings, you can check out hey-kings.com. For industry news, more podcast episodes, go to hey-kings.com. And a special thank you to Nick Palmieri at Palmieri Sound, who does all of our editing. And thank you to Jessica Palmieri for doing all of our social media marketing. Mm -hmm.